This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 475, recorded on January 5th, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast All About Viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Despommier. Happy New Year, Vincent. Thanks. You too, Dixon. Thanks. And uh, it's it's really cold. Do they actually want to know? And we got, we got six <laughs> inches of snow yesterday. That's right. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Kathy. Happy New Year. Same to you. you too. We are having another beautiful sunny day. So, yes, the temperatures are cold, but with that are clear skies and sunny days, which for us uh, can be kind of rare in the wintertime here in Michigan. So I'll take the cold. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. It's cold here, too. Yeah, bad. How cold is it, Alan? It's actually the same temperature you've got. It's 12 Fahrenheit, minus 11 C. Um, it is supposed to get down to minus 1 Fahrenheit tonight. Right. And minus nine Fahrenheit Saturday night. Jesus. I heard that every state in the union today has freezing temperatures, right? That's true. That's remarkable. Mm. Let's wow. find out what it is in Austin, in- Texas. Including Hawaii? Well, uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> well, they could up on the mountain. Rich, on the, on the, mountains, yeah, on the mountain. Rich Condit, welcome. Hey, good to be here. Uh, so we do not have freezing temperatures here. We did have four consecutive days of overnight freezes. I got up one morning and it was 18 Fahrenheit, mm. right. which is, uh, that's uh, unusual there for, goes the uh, yeah. for Austin. <laughs> but it has passed us by and today is 61 Fahrenheit, 16 C and beautiful sunny nice. day. Nice. It's nice. So the worst has passed for us. So when I, when I came in today, we have a lot of wind here. My windows are leaky. Mm. And some of you remember in the past hearing whistling, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it really is disruptive for the podcast. So I figured out how to tape up the joints Stroke between the joints. windows. I got some clear plastic tubing in the lab and I put it in the joint and I, I dried the joint because it was all frozen on the inside from condensation. I got a heater and dried it off and I taped the tubing in and now it's silent, right, Dixon? This is true. It's just it's, it's like a two foot area of the window where there was a gap and it was whistling in. Yeah. So when you say you got a heater to dry it, is that did you have a hair dryer? <laughs> no, it's a floor heater that uh, Saul Silverstein has because uh, it can be chilly here. And I just, we used to have a hair dryer as a piece of lab equipment. No, no of course, with the yeah, chromatography, yeah. of course. Yeah, Alan, in the lab we had taped the windows, right? Yeah. So, well, so- we had actually um, we stuffed uh, surgical tubing around the edges of the windows and then taped them. Yeah, because uh, yeah. we had the same problem in there. These are old windows. There's no insulation. In fact. There are keyholes in these windows, the idea being you can right. get a key, open the window, you swing it out, and then you could wash it, which only happens if you pay. Right. <laughs> and the wind comes whistling through the keyholes. It's crazy. It's uh, true. So someone should ask me, how cold is it? How cold is how it? How cold is it? It's so cold that all the politicians have their hands in their own pockets. Uh. Where did you hear that one? I heard that one once. I think it was on the Dick Cavett show. I never okay. forgot it. This is the first uh, TWIV or any of the Microbe TV podcasts for 2018. Right. And hopefully I can remember 2018. <laughs> Sorry, but I do like the number this year. Last year, 2017, that was an odd year. Don't like that. And You know, all my thermostats I have on even numbers because I'm very superstitious. <laughs> Drive, wow. And I know when really? people change it to 67 in the house, my daughter tr- trying to mess with me you should have played baseball for a little my car it's all on even yeah it's so silly it's it's a silly thing for a scientist but for some reason i don't know why i should have played baseball i was no good (laughs) is there an even number on the uh, wall of no 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 no, not at all but what i was going to say was what was i talking about 17 was worse than 18 17 was worse than 17 was a Pretty crappy year in many ways. So, hope, well, not for podcasting. It was great for podcasting. So, who knows this answer? It was two seventeen and two eighteen prime numbers or not? Twenty seventeen, I think, was yeah. a prime number. I think that was prime. Yeah, it's prime. And yeah, in what two eighteen? No, it's not. No, not a prime. It's even. Number. It's even. Even number. Right. Okay. There you are. But prime numbers are good, right? 
Well, oh, yeah, prime I number. think it's, so, but so it's I'm good a prime, to be in your prime. I am yeah. now a prime number. I'm <laughs> 65. Prime. Yes, happy birthday. Thank you. Happy You're birthday. not a prime number. I'm not? No, 65 he, is divisible by five. He's five. not a, he's oh, not it a is. prime number. He's a prime suspect. Sorry, it's not. You're right. It's divisible by five. Ooh. You, you'll be in your prime again at 67, 66 right? 66 is no good. 67, yeah, that looks not divisible. 78. I'm 77, so that's not a... Uh, you're divisible by 11 or 7. You're 77, you said? Yeah. yeah oh, not... here, here's an interesting 12 fun facts about the prime number 2017. <laughs> yeah. 2017 <laughs> pi rounds rounded to the nearest integer is a prime. 2017 e rounds to the nearest integer is a prime. The sum of all oh. odd primes up to 2017 is a prime number. And that's just three of the fun 12 facts. You can just mm. Google 2017 is a prime <laughs> number and find the rest. <laughs> All right, now uh, I don't, Kat- I'd rather have a prime rib. <laughs> a prime rib, Kathy. What's up with ASV? Oh, just that we're now in 2018, and <laughs> February 1st is the abstract deadline, and that is just 25 days away from mm-hmm. Sunday when this episode is released. 25 days to get your abstract wow. yeah. written and submitted. Oh, dear. You got to do all the experiments in those 25 days, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, you can make it open-ended and hope they work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some people do that. And you can always tell the ab- when you read the abstract, <laughs> yeah. we'll be discussed. <laughs> right. And then the talk is totally different. Exactly. <laughs> it didn't work out. Exactly. All right. We had some, besides my birthday this past week, we had Paul B. Nash. It turns out yesterday, I think, was Harmeet Malik's birthday. Nice. And yesterday was also Ray Ortega's birthday, a friend of the show, employee of ASM. He himself is subject of a TWIV special recently. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Dixon, can you read this lovely uh, limerick that I you can, wrote? I wrote it, so I think yeah. I should read it. Vincent podcasts like a pro, though his age is not something you'd know, because his voice is as crisp as a young will-o'-wisp, but his telomere is running on low. <laughs> well I, done, I, Dixon. I have telomerase. Hmm. I have telomerase. Still. We all have to yeah. raise. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're burning the genome at both ends. Exactly. But what a lovely a good title. Uh, what, what a lovely transcript. <laughs> <laughs> if we ever do a telomerase episode, we have to remember that burning you the know, genome. You know that for a new the year, for a New Year's episode that might work. You know, you know the tag of that, right? Tag of what? Who said that? Who said what? The, she Candle she was accused. No, 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 no. Oh. It was the. Um, the Cafe Society group in New York, Dorothy Parker was a member, and someone says, Dorothy, you know that you're burning your candle at both ends. And she turned to them and said, yes, but what a lovely light. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> nice to be quick, huh? Very, she was like, mm. the Algonquin room at uh, the hotel or something. Okay. Well, thank you for that nice, I came in one day, there was a bottle of wine and a nice limerick from Dixon. Well, Alan was my uh, editor, I must confess, and I sent him about how many, 200, and you said, no, 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 no. Not no. about 12, and yeah. I said, this one's probably the best. <laughs> probably. He got tired He didn't even you. say it was the best, he says, probably the best. Yeah. And just but, think, I wasn't even nice to you. No, that, you know, you were fair so next year. I think 217, you were not terrible. No, but 2016, I was. Yeah, well, that was Okay, sorry. Different. All right, I want to, we're going to do our year-end episode. Mm-hmm. We're going to review 2017 in virology, but I want to tell you a little bit about what happened in TWIV. Uh, we released 52 episodes last year, 422, 474. We had four special episodes, Vincent Munster, Ray Ortega, and Dave Tuller twice. We had 11 road shows with guests, almost one a month. That's up from seven last year. We had 14 in-studio episodes with guests and i was amazed that we had done 25 of those in 2016 that was a lot like two a month yeah wow we had 10 episodes with video up from seven last year now um our downloads by the month ranged from a low in september of 54,574 downloads now this is all the episodes of twiv ever uh, I, I tried to find how to break it down I, could but i'd have to manually add it up and as we know we're not i'm not good at math so and the high was in may 100,496 downloads and it ranged all in between between 55,000 to 100,000 january last january was pretty good 97,000 december was 59,900 <clears throat> almost 60 but 
Total for 2017, 862,545 downloads. Again, all shows, not just 2017. All-time downloads, 5.3 million. You know, Vincent, if every one of those people sent us a dollar. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be in um, Caribbean right now celebrating. <laughs> so if you figure there are 10,000 steady listeners. Yeah. Huh? But there may be more. 10,000 a month would be, be great. sweet, as they say. Very oh. sweet. But that's okay. It's, it's just what we get what we deserve, I guess, right? Yeah. Most popular download in 2017 of a 2017 envelope was TWIV 439, the purloined envelope. <laughs> so far, it has 18,491 downloads. I wonder why that is. Now, that was Paul B. Nash. It was a cool topic. Do you think it was the title? Maybe. Maybe. We have cool titles a lot, though. I know. Yeah. I know. I don't know why certain episodes. Paul would say it was, me, it was him, of course. It <laughs> Maybe could he very posted well be. it on Facebook or something. Yeah, sometimes you get linked somewhere. Who knows? Now, in case you're interested in where people are listening, um, by country, the U.S. has most of the downloads of those 5 million, 3.3 million. But then in order, descending order, the U.K., Canada, Australia, Germany, China, Ireland, Sweden, Nigeria, and the Netherlands. I think that's pretty cool that Nigeria is uh, is up there yeah. in the top 10, yeah, right? I like that. And then we have by region. We can break it down granularly. This is very interesting. In the U.S., California is the number one downloading region, followed by New York. That's you and I downloading, Dixon. It is, constantly. <laughs> Virginia, <laughs> Texas, Missouri. Very surprised at Missouri, actually. Yeah. Um, Washington, Massachusetts. That's Alan downloading over and over. Yes, repeatedly. Then we have Hartford in the U.K. Hmm. It's like the one foreign place that's, up there with all these. We have unknown in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last, uh, the 10th is Maryland. That's an interesting hmm. mix. So California, New York by, by population, I guess. Mm -hmm. Even Texas, right? Virginia, I figure a lot of NIH people must live there. Or scientist types. Yeah, I mean, most of these, there's a lot of science. Yeah. I don't know Missouri, though. That's a kind of an outlier. I don't remember seeing it last year when I did this. So, yeah. so welcome, Missouri. Welcome to Missouri <laughs> and Hertford. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So uh, we were actually named one of the 11th, 11 best science podcasts of, of the year by Matthew Eckwall in the Scientist magazine. He said nice things too. That's great. He just doesn't like the weather. He doesn't like the, how we go on about the weather. While their frequent banter about the <laughs> weather can sometimes be a little tiresome. Podcast provides an often captivating look into the world of viruses. And that's what we like to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we had some good competition here. Um, so it's good. Thank you for naming us. We've never been named anything before. Well, at least they didn't say it in public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, it's, I think it's pretty cool that we made somebody's top 11 list. Yeah. Why yes. do they have 11 and not 10? They want to be different or they couldn't add oh, they, they couldn't These never, go up yeah. to 11. Plus, 11 is a prime number. <laughs> we we have sometimes done 11 top virology stories of the year. Just well, I'll tell you, we could use some more spaces here. We could use 52 there, we spaces. Of, well, we yeah. kind of use this as, exactly. a, as a summary of the whole year. Yeah, so this, right. the 10 is just a rubric. We don't yeah, know. we don't have a, we ought to have, we ought a summary. We ought to, 11 ought to be a summary of the weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that would work. The top weather events of the year. I want to thank Jennifer for doing the timestamps. Uh, in 2017, she has defended her thesis in September and moved on, so she's no longer doing that. And I also want to thank the American Society for Microbiology, the American Society for Virology for hosting episodes, and also all the places that hosted us, University of Wisconsin, Madison, Cornell, the Nito Virus Meeting in Kansas City, Rocky Mountain Laboratories, remember Dixon? Who could forget? Penn State, not Penn, University of Pennsylvania, sorry, Penn uh, Tufts, Dental School, and Indiana University. At the Capsid Club. The Capsid Club. Capsid Club. If you want to join. <laughs> Bring your protein sequencer. <laughs> Someone actually wrote, how can I join, on some social media that I broadcasted that on. Cap Someone wrote, can I join the Capsid Club? And all of, Well, uh, they, they just kind of pick you up. They're self-assembling. They're self-assembling, <laughs> right. Capsid Club. And uh, Dixon, Kathy, 
Rich, Alan, thank you so much for doing this oh, in the past hey, year. Thank you. you are like every Friday. It's amazing <laughs> that you're willing to do this. I really appreciate it. That's really cool. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And I do want to make a kind of plea to our listeners. If you're on social media and you see us announcing the show, Twitter, Google+, Facebook, just like it or retweet it. Very few people do that, but it really helps because it you know gets things amplified. Yeah, I mean, I do have so many followers and Alan and so forth, but it helps to amplify that. So please retweet it. It's not doesn't hurt. It doesn't uh, take very much um, energy. It does, do doesn't that. cost you anything. It would really help us a lot. So here are 10, uh, 10 different collections, it turns out. <laughs> yes. It used to be we had a story, 10 stories, but then it became collections, which, you know, we only do 52 tours a year. And there's so many good virology stories out there. And, you know. We could do an hourly virology podcast, but no one would join me. But, uh, you know, so we have to have a little selectivity. And these are in no particular order. I have to say that I was amazed by TWIV444, Kate Rubens, yeah. the astronaut. Yes. And this was at ASM in New Orleans, and Rich Condit was there. Um you know, leading up to it, we were trying to arrange the timing, and at first it wasn't going to work. I said, okay, no problem. And Chris Kandayan, who was at ASM at the time, he said, Vincent, we have an astronaut. We have to make this work. <laughs> we, have, we have an astronaut. It's like it re reminded me of Houston, we have a problem. Yes, failure is not an option. Um right. Because I thought, eh, an astronaut, you know, okay, fine, you know. It's, those are not But you know what? People. She was amazing. They she was are. a great, she was, great She's guest. really nice. She's just so sincere in answering and really interesting about what she was doing in space. And, you know, they do selectively take people and make sure they have certain qualities. And you can tell they're all really nice people pretty much. And unusual people. And unusual people. And she, she was just so much fun to talk to. <laughs> yeah. You know, and she threw out shirts for us, and she was great about answering questions. So I thought Astro Kate, the right stuff, was a really yeah, good, good title. And she is a virologist, too, which is cool. Right. That's right. And interrupted her, her career to to uh, enter the astronaut corps. But what she is doing up there I think when you've been cool. in the astronaut corps, you can go right back to whatever career you were in, and they'll take you. That's true. Yeah, probably. Although I, come I, on. I, I don't that, think she that, wants to. I think she's happy to. That all excuses. Oh, no, yeah. I talked to her about that. She's going to she, 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 she's gonna, she's gonna, she's gonna, yeah. but, but most of So, them, Rich, you were going to um, meet up with her. Did you ever do that? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I just I had on my New Year's uh, pick list uh, to write her, and because she— uh, suggested that uh, we come and visit, in, in particular uh, with 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 the kids. So I just wrote her an email, um, uh, following up on that, and hopefully she'll give us the cool. Cook's tour of NASA. That would be great. Cool. Har Harper yeah. got uh, the uh, Women of NASA Legos kit. Nice, yeah, uh, for <laughs> Christmas. And I I should have sent a picture of her with her Legos kit to to Kate uh, along with my email. To grease the skids, but I don't think that's going to be necessary. She's sincere and she's enthusiastic. You know, I think part of the whole NASA shtick is to uh, have people who will promote the whole space program. Yes, well, um, I was going to do so well. Sure, I was going to speak to that because I, I um, had the privilege of interviewing and uh, introducing Story Musgrave to uh, our audience here in Columbia. Uh, for a memorial lecture, and then we had dinner afterwards, and I sat next to him, and it was just very exciting to speak to someone who's been in outer space six different times, right? Mm. And he, the reason why he was here was because he's a PNS graduate. Yeah. So, mm. did he go back to medicine? No. Do you know what he did? He got a job in the PR department at Disney in Orlando mm. to <laughs> hype space. Oh, that okay. was what he wanted to do. After that, yeah. he just wanted to say, this is such a great thing. Right. And I want everyone to know about it. And just just like you said. So I think a lot of them don't go back to the to the lives that they had before because their lives yeah. are totally changed as a result of what they did. One of the coolest things that uh, Kate uh, came up with that I really loved that I was relating just last night, I think, was when I asked her, um, you know, how cool was the spacewalk? And she said, that's what we call type two fun. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> he says it's really a it's really a pain while you're doing it, but afterwards it was great. <laughs> <laughs> What's type one fun? 
Uh, it's that's just fun when you're do. having fun while you're doing it. I see. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. It's not too fun. Yeah, that was cool. All right, Kathy, you put together number two. Why don't you tell us about that? I think the things that I like the best are when we find out about the really cool things that viruses do that are either unexpected for that type of virus or just something we never imagined. And so whenever we have stories like that, I like it. So the first one was the astrovirus story that we had on TWIB 423, which was a uh, paper from Stacey Schultz Cherry's lab, where we learned that astrovirus capsids are enterotoxins. So we know that Bacteria produce enterotoxins, and it was also known that uh, SIV and uh, is it rotavirus? Yeah, rotavirus um, have uh, non. Well, rotavirus has a non-structural glycoprotein that's an enterotoxin, and SIV uh, it's a glycoprotein as well. But this is a non-enveloped virus, the astrovirus, that causes a lot of diarrhea, and to have its capsid be the enterotoxin, I just thought was really cool. Yeah. Then we learned some things about uh, giant viruses, and we kind of touched on those last week, but one was that the giant viruses, the Clausinoid viruses, encode a lot of stuff for translation, seemingly more than the other giant viruses that we already knew about. And so they encode the amino acyl tRNA synthetases, which are the enzymes that attach amino acids to the tRNAs. They encode those for all 20 amino acids. So that's really comprehensive and interesting. And then we also learned, that was TWIV 437, on TWIV 440 about giant viruses, the Numea viruses, that really quickly, within the first 30 minutes of infection, make the nucleus temporarily leaky. And that's presumably so that they can get some host enzymes from the nucleus to synthesize their RNA in the cytoplasm. And so we don't know anything more about that mechanism and how it works in 30 minutes and how the nucleus is only temporarily leaky. So I think we're going to be learning more interesting things about that in the future. But to me, those are some really cool things we learned about viruses. So this new Mia virus episode was called, I hardly knew Mia virus. Right. And one of the, the paper by, from the labs of Jean-Claude, Jean-Michel Claverie and Chantal Abergel. Uh, one of the words they used in the paper was circumvolution. That yes. Virus circum oh, right. I can't yes. remember the context, but I looked it up. Some, we, yeah. I was looking for an image, and I just searched for circumvolution. I found this lovely <laughs> piece of art um, by um, an artist, Ninad Serovich, which I used for the episode art. So I thought that was interesting that someone has made something called circumvolution. And then he wrote to me and he said, even though you made fun of me, it is a word. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alan, I think you liked Doctor's Twiv. I did. Doctor's Twiv go to Washington. And what I what I was really pointing to here is this this kind of movement, um, the March for Science, uh, when it it went from being a um kind of a hashtag on social media to being an actual event to being an actual movement. And I still get emails from these people and they've got a whole thing going on. Um, and this was the process of scientists as a group really becoming politically aware as a result of some really bad stuff that's happening in politics in the United States right now. And I think we're all quite aware of that. Um, and uh, Ed Young did a good write-up of the march, um, but our episode where, where we all went to Washington and, and recorded an episode there, and, and then we went and participated in the march, which was wet and cold and yet terribly inspiring, um, was, was all part of this whole thing. And this, this debate about, oh, scientists shouldn't participate in politics is thankfully kind of over. You know, people have realized that you can't just ignore the political process in the current environment and we need to participate. We need to take a stand in favor of reality, in favor of facts, because bizarrely, those things are actually under attack. Um, so that was to me, that was kind of an inspiring moment for for the show and for science in general. Yeah, it was fun. We did that at ASM headquarters. Yeah. And we had, and Kathy was at some other science communication like, thing. Yeah, right? Kathy mm -hmm. was. Kathy, was, you were picked for an award, weren't you? Yeah, I was a pointer fellow at the at Yale. Yeah, right. 
And uh, we had Stefano Bertuzzi and Susie Sharp coming in from Europe somewhere yep. on a TV next to us. So that was a lot. We actually had an audience. We threw out little giant microbes at the end. Yep. So it was a lot of fun. I, I collected number four from shows that all of you liked, and I yeah. put them under the rubric unexpected stuff. <laughs> yes. Stuff you just like, oh my gosh, this is, and one is 451 Expectorate the Unexpected. And this was a paper where they, this is mosquitoes transmitting West Nile virus, and they would sequence uh, what the mosquito was taking up and what they transmitted. Technology now lets you do these kinds of experiments. And what they found in this paper is that uh, with each blood meal, they transmit a different West Nile virus population, but in the bird host, the differences are purged. They go away, and that happens over and over again because there's some selection in the host. That, well, we don't want most of your variation. You know, I, I just I wouldn't have predicted that, so I thought that was pretty yeah. cool. As much as anything else, I like the technology in that paper. Technology, you know, yes. To, mm-hmm. Yeah, to get that kind of information from individual mosquitoes and and their expectorates. You know, it's amazing. That's a good title, too. Yes. Uh, the other, another one was 470, just a passing phage. The idea that bacteriophage particles can move across monolayers of eukaryotic cells. Mm-hmm. That was just bizarre. And yeah. who knows what it means? Maybe we'll find out. So there was a spec. I read this in Cosmos magazine just recently. Gee, you read that? <laughs> My favorite magazine. No, it, it said that perhaps these phages are moving into the blood and knocking off Maybe. pathogens. Maybe. No. Got to show it, right? That's their, you know, take. Uh, four or five, six, be careful of cannons. So that basically <laughs> summarizes this whole group. I thought this was really cool. This is where uh, Brianne Barker joined us. Um, first of all, the, it was two different stories in this. The first is that. Mutations in RNA polymerase 3 gene predispose children to severe varicella. Mm. Right. Yeah, your, your initial reaction to that is, What? Huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Because Paul 3 is basically producing transcripts um, that, are allowed, that are allowing sensing of the virus by the innate immune system. Right. And, you know, so basically Paul 3 is a sensor. <laughs> And we never, I just would never have predicted that, right? Um, and then um, the other part of that show was detection of an RNA virus by a DNA sensor in the cell. And this is a really cool story where dengue virus infects, damages mitochondria. Mitochondria DNA is released. It's then sensed by the C-gas system, and you initiate an innate immune response. Again, totally counter to what you would think, but the, an RNA virus being sensed by a DNA sensor, yeah, it's kind of indirect, but really cool stuff. <laughs> I love that one. That's a really good one. should change the name of the sensor. <laughs> well, it's mostly, uh, it is a DNA sensor for, for DNA viruses, right? But it just so happens that it works in this case. Oh, no. DNA shouldn't be in the cytoplasm. That's the bottom line. Because it's all true. 455, pork and genes. Wonderful. And this one is where, this is maybe, this is in the area of, I can't believe they did this. Right. Yeah. Uh, they re, they removed, they created pigs free of endogenous retroviruses, yeah. basically, so they could use Actually, them for they, transmission. They inactivated all they, of the endogenous yeah, retroviruses. They used CRISPR to inactivate these, them all. These. And we had talked about this in the, in the podcast with Paul Beanash, and he said, no, no, that can't be possible. And uh, if, the next week, Jeremy Lubin emailed us and said, yeah, George Church did it. Here's the paper. He said, never underestimate George Church, <laughs> who's quite a force in molecular biology. Crispy. Yeah, it's um, uh, amazing. That, that, you know, as I was looking into this paper, I didn't actually expect them to go all the way and make pigs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That that didn't have, uh, that had inactivated uh, yeah. ret, uh, endogenous retrovirus. Amazing. And then the other one in this group, conjunction, junction, what's your function? 432, a gamete fusion protein. Uh, this came from Tetrahymena was one of the organisms, and the other one was Chlamydomonas, I think, if I remember. These were viral fusion proteins. They came from viral fusion proteins. And the, one of the groups was up at Cornell, I remember. Uh, I, I just think that I, it's amazing, right? It's, it's, it's a gamete protein that's needed for fusion of gametes during reproduction, and it came from a viral fusion protein. 
the next one, four four three on a leaf, no one can hear you scream. <laughs> this is just a paper that I came across in some looking for something. Um, it's in a funny kind of journal, which it, it's in the Royal Society Publishing. What the hell is the name? I'm trying to get it up here. It's a bit slow. Oh, here, Proceedings of the Royal Society B. <laughs> I don't know what A is, but this yeah. is B. So it's a journal that I don't really look at, but it turned out to be such a cool paper. Basically, um, this wasp-associated virus, the, the wasp uh, lays its egg in a, in a lady bird or ladybug, right? Mm -hmm. The ladybug uh, hatches the cocoon but gets paralyzed, so the ladybug stays on top of it and protects it until the wasp comes out. And about a quarter of the ladybugs, they're paralyzed while they're doing this and twitching to scare away predators. Right. And then a quarter of them recover and go on to have happy lives. <laughs> it's just... Well, I don't know if they have happy lives. They may be deeply <laughs> traumatized by this event. They're probably traumatized, yeah. They're more that, paralysis, that paralysis and twitching is well-timed and is the virus in the nervous system of, That's right. uh, right. of the That's ladybug, exactly right. right? That's part Amazing. of what showed in the paper. And, I mean, the title of the paper, Who is the Puppet Master? It's just great. Now, Actually, they should have titled it "On a Leaf, No One Can Hear You Scream." Right. <laughs> that was a great title. <laughs> now, this kind of behavior manipulation we've we've talked about before on Twiv with the wasps injecting viruses that are in, in their genome into caterpillars to suppress their immune system, and then there was one a while ago. I don't know if you remember where a virus delivers genes to a plant that makes the plant give off organics that attract right. aphids, but they taste badly. So as soon as they take a little sap and they get a little virus, they fly away. Right. Perfect. Right. Right. <laughs> Stuff like that. I, I, this, this is cool. I love this behavior manipulation. So uh, that was that one. That's number five. Now, yep. a couple of you liked our episode at ASV. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Like Mavis, Mavis, the structure maven, she right. was great. She was just just an amazing guest with a, an amazing story. And, um, of course, we had a huge audience. That was a nice touch. Yeah, we were all uh, there, actually. We were all there. Yeah, we were. And um, we have video. And, yeah, we had a great audience who didn't make much noise at all, right? No. They, were, no. they were wrapped. They were, they were in awe. Yeah, it was a good uh, – she has had a great career. And there's someone who was – and she talked about this, how she's done things that impact people, like working on viruses that are used for gene therapy. Mm -hmm. And that was really, really cool. Coming from the coming from a small village in Africa. Yeah. I forget which I forget which country. Nigeria. Was Nigeria. It? Yeah, Nigeria. Yeah, Nigeria. 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 She's, she's got that. She walked around barefoot. Yeah, she's got years. that. She didn't wear shoes until she was like eleven years old or something like right. that. She's got that marvelous picture of her and her and her her mates, you know. She had this great, great story where she said she, her husband wanted to go to Michael Rossman's lab, you know, and he says, well, I have, my wife is going to come with me. And he said, put her on the phone. Let me talk to her. Yeah. And he talked to her for a few minutes and, she, and he said, yeah, you're fine. You can work for us too. Yeah. And she went and then her whole career came out of that. It was great. She, it was really fun when she said it. Uh, then we have a number seven. I, I called these and these were again, episodes that various people picked i call the viruses are us yeah right they they do things for us or they're part of us that or we stole parts from them yeah and the riddle of the skinks was about yes the retrovirus driving the development of a lizard's placenta and i must say i didn't know lizards had them so that i right. learned something right there mm -hmm. <laughs> i thought that was really cool but of course the placenta being driven by the envelope protein of retroviruses is is Multiple times, multiple animals have that happening for them. So this, to me, this was just a, uh, a marvel of convergent evolution. Yes. It's just amazing. The, the, the placenta arose multiple times through different thefts of retroviral envelope right. proteins. Like right. that's, that's just so parallel. Right. Another um, in the same theme was... Um, 439, the purloined envelope, our most, our people's choice of people's 20, choice, yeah. 2017. It was Paul B. Nash talking about 
co-option of an endogenous retrovirus envelope for host defense in hominid ancestors. And so this is the envelope protein, uh, which they've pulled out uh, of, of primates, of primate genomes, and this um, blocks infection with other retroviruses, and they could reconstitute that and show that. So it's basically, uh, how, how do you put this? Uh, it's not like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> could be. Well, anyway, another example of how um, viruses are us. And then the other one was 434, Live Long and Pupate. I like that one. It's a great <laughs> title. <laughs> Alan Dove has done most of them. He has. He has. I think that was one of mine. Clever yeah. guy. The um, Again, a wasp virus. This is a new negative-stranded RNA virus of wasps discovered in a search doing sequencing of wasps that regulates its longevity and the sex ratio. Of the wasp. It's amazing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. More behavior modification, I guess you could call it. All right, number eight. I, again, I, co I collected a bunch <clears throat> into a category called antiviral RNA. We talked quite a bit about antiviral RNA <clears throat> in the past year. 433 poops, viruses, and worms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the, it's uh, antiviral RNA defense, which is uh, part of the defense of C. elegans, which, as Dixon will agree, is a nematode. He would definitely agree. Or is it a nematode? It's either or. <laughs> or it's either. Or. <laughs> I was about to repeat that. And so the worm uh, antiviral defense is, depends hugely on RNA interference. Amazing. And a nice paper where, you know, for a long time there weren't viruses of C. elegans that you could use. Mm. Uh, but um, in this paper... I think it was VSV they showed will <laughs> will replicate in yes mm -hmm. VSV replicates in just about anything right Kathy <laughs> they showed it replicates in C elegans and they could demonstrate that RNA interference is important for preventing infection uh, then we had two consecutive RNA interference episodes four four nine the sound of non silencing from Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> And um, RNA interference confer. So there's this was a. It still is a controversy whether RNA interference as an antiviral mechanism is really important in mammalian cells. There are some who feel that it is, and some who feel that we don't need it because we have other ways to prevent virus infection. Um, and so there's a continuing controversy in this. I think in this one we discussed a paper that um, there's evidence that there is some contribution to antiviral immunity. However, the next episode, um, the next very next week, uh, Ben Tenuver, Ben Tenuver and RNA out, number 450, he said he didn't really um, believe that <laughs> RNAi <laughs> plays a role in mammalian antiviral defenses. But he came to join us and talk about his finding that RNA-3 nucleases, which are used to mature Cellular RNAs are a very old antiviral RNA recognition platform in all the domains of life. Really cool stuff. And I had heard him talk about this at, at ASV. And uh, I said, you have to come and, and talk about this on TWIF because it's a really cool story. Number nine, viruses as tools. We didn't do a lot on this, but I thought using rabies virus to trace neural connections is just an amazing story. And now, the vector. That is pretty cool. The vectors that have undergone multiple um, evolutions. There are many different generations of vectors. And this is a very cool one because it's self-inactivating, so it doesn't destroy or harm the neurons in any way. Uh, they, they inactivate themselves, but they can give you traces, and you can put fluorescent proteins in them so you can see where they're going. Just spectacular technology. And just think, rabies virus, we can modify it and have it just do at our beckoning. So tools is a cool <clears throat> subject. Mm -hmm. Now, listeners, which do you think is the family of viruses that was most discussed in 2017 in TWIV? Just I, I, can, I can almost taste it. Ooh. 
<laughs> That's right. It would be the Flavy viruses. We had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten episodes. If we had two more, we could have Flavy of the Month. Yeah. We could. I've heard you say that before. You have. So we did a lot and of I've Zika. Said it again. <laughs> we did a lot. We did West Nile. Yep. We did a lot of dengue, especially yep. the last few weeks. Did a chicken gunya? That's not an alpha, a flavy. That's an alpha. I was just going to say. Yeah, you were. <laughs> I, and I, I think we mentioned yellow fever at one time or another. <laughs> There's been Probably. a few outbreaks. But we we had so I would say flavies have to be in the top uh, ten. It's number ten because uh, we talked so much about them. So here's the thing. I mean, all of these topics, cool things viruses do. We'll we'll continue to have lots of stories on that. I don't know about viruses in space, but maybe. Unexpected stuff is always going to happen. We'll be looking out yep. for those. Uh, behavior manipulation. Viruses are us. Antiviral RNA. Cool guests. We'll have cool more guests. Viruses as tools. Um, and, you know, the year before, 2016, we did a lot of Ebola virus. This year we did quite a few Zika virus episodes. Who knows what the virus of 2018 will be? We do not know. Maybe hard, it'll be flu. Hard to predict. Maybe it will be flu. The actual Zika outbreak was 2016, is that right? Mostly, yeah. I think. Uh, started, so so yeah, we got through a whole year without a new outbreak, which is actually unusual. It's almost like an outbreak a year. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's correct. Mm-hmm. So you're saying 2017 was pretty quiet in, in terms yeah. of the virus. Yeah, quiescent. Too well, quiet. Well, you know, there's there certainly exactly. have been <laughs> things going on that maybe we didn't so there was an, a yellow fever issue in Africa where there was not yeah. enough vaccine. There was There's LASA ongoing all the time with many thousands of infections. Well, and there's a yellow fever vaccine manufacturing problem that I think we touched on. Yeah, I believe we did. And, of course, uh, scattered through all the episodes are, are what Kathy calls our soapbox things. Yes. <laughs> Another friend of mine would call them soap dish things. But soap <laughs> dish. Soap dish. Yeah, that's good. Now, what's the difference between a soap box and a dish? A dish is uh, a small dish thing? Is smaller. Yeah, maybe. Oh. Yeah. I can't stand on but, it. Though. Yeah. <laughs> so we we talked a lot about publication issues, whether there are too many postdocs, uh, the 80-hour week, and that one's probably going to continue with <laughs> more reader emails. Uh, we talked about various aspects of politics, uh, the budget, Trump's war on science, things like that. We also uh, talked about the gain of function and the change in the regulations on that that just recently happened. And then one that we even talked about a paper about was one from the uh, two virologists at, uh, at Madison who have documented the gender parity in virology meetings. And so that's Rob Kaleda and Ann Palmenberg. Started back when Ann was putting together a spreadsheet. I think it was when she was ASV president and was going to be looking at who she was going to invite for her speakers at ASV. But uh, they characterized the gender parity at four different virology meetings and they came up with uh, some interesting findings and some suggestions. Things like You know, if you have a woman on the organizing committee, you're more likely to have women speakers. Um, And they even cited some data from the American Society for Microbiology Mm -hmm. about that, not just Mm -hmm. ASV data or virology meeting data. So um, I I think that was a good thing to get out there. And they really did a lot of data analysis for that. And uh, I think it's an important topic that if you really focus on it, you can get some gender parity in your uh, speaker lists for meetings, your convener lists, and all of those things are important. And not only should we be doing that for women in science, but any kind of underrepresented minority in science, wherever we can do that. I think that... And this this isn't just... um, I think it's important to point out this isn't just a feel good effort of let's, you know, try to represent all groups. This is it, when you hold a conference, you're trying to represent what's going on in a field. And if you if you have a skewed group that does not represent the workforce actually doing the work in that field, it's a very strong indication that your conference is not doing a good job of covering the field. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you if you have a bunch of dudes at ASV talking about virology and that's your whole all your panels, um, you'll hear some interesting talks, but 
there is so much other work going on being done by people who didn't match that description that <laughs> you're going to have to say, well, it, is there bias in the selection of this group mm-hmm. that is skewing what we're seeing of of the virology? And sure enough, you know, you get better representation, you get a more diverse topic coverage, and you get more diverse approaches to the science just because you've broadened the net in another way. The uh, ASM data you mentioned, Kathy, on conferences, I think they published that in MBio. Mm-hmm. I think so. I just saw today a tweet from it related Arturo Casa de Val, nice summary of a study showing that males are more common at the first position and author associations stating the first two authors contributed equally. Hmm. So another <laughs> similar study, right? Coming wow. Out. Yep. Soap dish. I have to write that down. So soap remember. dish. Because we could have an episode someday of soap dishes and soap boxes, right? <laughs> yeah. right. Now I have an honorable mention in TWIV 460, Gary Cohen, this was at Penn, you know, I asked people, if you hadn't been a scientist, what would you have become? He said, I wanted, I would have run a porn shop, but with his accent, it sounded like something else. Yeah. And everybody, like the audience, laughed a lot. They thought that was funny. He meant a shop where people sell used items and, and resell them. Yeah, P-A-W-N. Not, yeah, P-A-W-N. Well, I thought it would be cool to uh, come up with what we think is the best title for 2017. <laughs> I really like Pork and Jeans. Anyone else? I really like uh, On a Leaf No One Can Hear You Scream. <laughs> that was, I think that might be my favorite, too. <laughs> that was, that's a good one. Yeah, and I really like The Riddle of the Skinks. <laughs> Did you like any, Dixon? All of them. All of them? Sure. So he, Dixon told me before he had a favorite episode that we didn't, that didn't come up either. It didn't. It and didn't. what was that, Dick? It was on the plaque acid, just how to do the plaque acid. Yeah, we uh, talked, we geeked out on plaque acid. <clears throat> we did, and it, it involved, this is the boring part of science that results in excitement. There's such a contrast in routine work versus the interpretation of routine work. Mm. And remember, remember how exciting it was when you were in charge of the sequencer? And you put your stuff in there, and you stared, you stared at this thing working, waiting for the sequence to come out. In the beginning, of course, it was a protein sequencer, and then now it's a DNA sequence. Now you just send it off. There's no excitement mm-hmm. at all at that. The excitement comes in not even when you get it back. It's when you run it through the computer and you check out to see what the motifs are or where. It, so the excitement is the same, but the way you generate that excitement is quite different now. So, so to pass. <clears throat> To pass that on to somebody who's just interested in, gee, I wonder if I'd like being a virologist. So I loved that issue because here's something that you just you do this every day. Vincent has an entire wall made out of the results from doing plaque assays. And yet, you know, it's it's it looks the same, but it's not the same. As soon as you tease out the data, it becomes very exciting. So I think I, they should put that in the museum. <laughs> when they put me in the museum, well, they'll put you next to it with an automaton. <laughs> they'll have it. They'll have it. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> in a, Disney a wax World. Vincent wreck and yellow. That's right. Or, that's right. That's what's right. that thing at Disney World that that's exhibit the that yeah, yeah, goes around in the circle? The, the animatronic. Animatronic. Um, that's all the, the presidents. Yeah, yeah. Right. they still have them. They're old now and it's all jerky. But it's so yeah, funny to right, watch right, them. Right, right. You know, turning their heads and blinking. Yeah. So I, I just, I liked it for its simplicity. Everybody contributed to the conversation. People troubleshot it. Troubleshot is that a right word? Or they, yeah, <laughs> they could, ask Kathy. <laughs> right? Is that a, is that a good word? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> troubleshot. I troubleshot my results. Sure. In the foot. <laughs> 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 but I I love because I get joined in the conversation because everybody's everybody. You know, it reminded me of this guy, um, the physicist. Um, Oh, come on. You know this guy. He was famous for his speeches and his talks to students and everything. And he died young, but mm-hmm. he... he uh, uh, Richard Feynman. That's Feynman, the one. That's yeah. the one. Feynman. He began his interest in physics by um, making radios. Mm. He bought the parts from all kinds of places and put them together and made radios. And that's that was his anecdote mm. for, for how he got interested in I science. I used to take TVs apart. Did you? Did you ever put them back together? No, no, no. no. <laughs> we used to get old TVs. These were the big... With the big glass tube. Oh, yeah. Take out all the components, the resistors, the, the capacitors. Ray tube. And 
and stuff I didn't know what they were. <laughs> right. And I would put all the parts in drawers. I'd sure. get those sure. drawer thingies. Sure, sure. And never look at them again. And eventually my mother would throw them all. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to turn the radio around so I could look into the back of the radio. Because yeah. it had these glowing tubes, right? Well, I did... When I got older, I bought Heath kits, and I used to put those together, yeah, and that, that was a lot of fun. Absolutely. And when I went to Peter Palazzi's lab, yeah. I bought two power supply kits from Heath Kit, right? Oh. And I put them together. I could do it in a couple of hours. Yeah. And he came into my office, and he said, don't ever do that again. You should be doing experiments. <laughs> <laughs> it's a waste of your time. Yeah, I still there. build radios. You know what? <laughs> I think that isn't a waste of your time. That's not a waste of time. Well, he thought I should be doing experiments. And those power supplies were, were pretty good. Oh. All right, there you go, 2017. It was a good year. It was a good year. Mm -hmm. we, we had a good, a good year uh, for TWIV. Good year for TWIV. Indeed. Yep. A good year for TWIV, right. Let's do some email. Andy writes, hi, everyone. I actually would have preferred if my aside about number of publications had not been read on air. <laughs> Oops. As Kathy said, I simply had wanted to provide some actual data to back up my claim that it is not necessary to work insane hours to succeed at research. My apologies. I should have been more clear. The other factors I mentioned, like failing fast, not devoting copious time to risky projects, not putting all your eggs in one basket, and passion for science are, in my experience, much more important. Also, Vincent was right. I meant George Church, not John Church. <laughs> I guess I had John on the brain from John Udell. Uh, perhaps then he has, this should be a separate paragraph, I think. Perhaps these science ask me anything interviews would make a good listener pick. Oh, yes, he's talking about Reddit. Uh, we, we, they ask me anything people, you know, right. anyone could do it. And George Church, he links to one from George Church. Uh, though the best interviews can be found right here on Twiv, Twim, and all your under, other wonderful podcasts. Thanks again for inspiring me countless times throughout grad school. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, unless you say you, you don't want it read, we're going to read it. We enjoy reading <laughs> yeah. your writing. So if you really. Well, and I thought it was a great, that, that was a great That was email, fine. Whole we, I do get emails. And, it, that, and it's best to say beforehand, please don't read the next section. Yeah. Because otherwise, we, I, we've actually had times where we're reading something on the air and then they say, please don't read that last bit. Yeah. Oh. I have had, I get occasional, not many emails where people say, please don't read this. I just want to tell you something. And no one ever hears about those unless <laughs> I think it's cool for us all day. I think I've sent you a few where it, I said, I just want you to see this, but we're not going to read it. Uh, Kathy, can you take the next one, please? I think Kathy muted herself or went away. I did. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Rebecca writes, hi, TWIV team. I'm writing because I've heard you all read several letters from prospective graduate students, and I have a link which they might find helpful. My sister, Beth Bowman, PhD, is the assistant director of the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program for Biomedical Research at Vanderbilt University. Because her job is focused on recruiting graduate students, she's developed a very helpful blog for future and current students, which is called Materials and Methods, <laughs> and can be found at <coughs> VanderbiltBiomedG.com. One of the main goals of this blog is to help prospective graduate students understand what recruiters are looking for in applications. Beth wants all interested students to understand how to successfully apply for graduate school and get relevant experience in a lab as early as possible. Beth has a real passion for reaching as many future scientists as possible, and I hope your listeners find this blog helpful. Keep up the good work on a very informative podcast. Thanks. Becky. And I want to point out, in case people have forgotten, that Vincent posts the letters each week. And so if there's a link in a letter that you didn't hear us read very well and you want to go back and check it out, you can always go to the letters and click on that and scroll till you find that one. So, But that was VanderbiltBiomedG.com, all one word. It's a cool. It's a cool this site. is doubtless a great, uh, great resource. The, the uh, interdisciplinary graduate program at uh, Vanderbilt is a model for interdisciplinary programs. Very good. So if you want to find any TWIV letters, it's, it's easy. Microbe.tv slash TWIV slash TWIV dash episode number dash letters. That didn't sound easy. <laughs> now, the easiest thing to do is just go to the TWIV site and click on the appropriate link at the top. <laughs> yeah. sounded too long. You don't think that's not easy? Well, it's for you. It is. It TV slash TWIV slash TWIV dash 475 dash letters. It rolls off your tongue. I, I do it the same every week, <laughs> so it's easy to do. It's the same with an episode. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. It's too hard, Dixon. Alan, you can, actually, you can, you can Google TWIV 
and then the episode number and then letters. Yeah, that'll get to it. And too. it'll give you well, the letters. Simpler, for that Google is faster than us. Yeah. What a world. <laughs> Alan, can you take the next one? Yes. Brian writes, Dear Twivers, I'm an assistant professor in the biochemistry and molecular pharmacology department at UMass Medical School in Worcester. It's a lovely minus two Celsius outside, and I just returned to my warm house from snow blowing our first seven inches of the year. I'm writing in regards to the conversation you had with John and Teddy Udell on TWIV 467 about the number of PhD trainees going through the pipeline. It was generally agreed by the guests and the TWIV panel that there are too many PhD trainees going through the pipeline and this number should be reduced. While I think that we as a community should pay attention to this number, I feel we should, be, we should not be turning away students who want to become thoughtful, rigorous scientists. Simple math tells us there are clearly not enough faculty positions to satisfy the number of PhD trainees going through the pipeline. However, a PhD in the biomedical sciences is much more useful than just simply as a step toward getting a faculty position. As many folks have shown, Alan Dove being one of them, a PhD in biomedical sciences can be used for a myriad of important and satisfying careers, such as biotech, education, policy, etc. Surely having more scientists in the world is a good thing, especially in government or policymaking. (coughs) I often think that my scientific skills could benefit the world more if I were on Capitol Hill rather than in my own lab, especially in these dark ages of Trumpish know-nothingism. I agree with the panel that the current academic landscape builds unreasonable expectations for trainees, but I propose a different solution than limiting the enrollment of PhD programs. I recommend two concrete, actionable steps that can be taken at the academic level to improve the science pipeline. My proposals will help destigmatize non-faculty positions, as many current trainees view attainment of the faculty position as success and anything else as failure. This destigmatization would possibly be the most important thing toward addressing the career problems for bio- biomedical PhDs. First, undergraduates should be informed as to the rate of obtaining a faculty career in biological sciences, currently less than 10%, before they enter graduate school. This should occur in undergrad classrooms. Likewise, graduate schools should publicize the rate of PhDs who enter the research faculty ranks during grad sc- student recruitment. If students are armed with the percent probability of attaining a faculty position, then they can accurately assess whether pursuit of a faculty position is a risk worth taking. Second, graduate schools must incorporate career skills and planning directly into their curriculum. This type of integrated curriculum can educate grad students as to the various careers that are available to them and then help them plan for their career choices. Students should be exposed to PhD scientists in a myriad of professions so they can obtain knowledge, inspiration, and mentorship. These career programs need to come from the university rather than individual faculty because faculty such as myself simply don't have the skills or knowledge in these non-faculty careers to properly navigate trainees through this process. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that UMass Med School already has a world-class career planning program in place. Perhaps the esteemed Alan Dove could be a career panelist. Uh, but in fact, that's something that I do periodically when invited. Um, about five years ago, so uh, Brian, give me a call. Uh, about five years ago, the university began programs to integrate career and professional development skills into the curriculum. The program has been wildly successful. Students have been enthusiastic, and the program receives extremely high grades in student evaluations. The program also functions as an effective tool for recruiting top students. Additionally, the program has benefited training grant and fellowship applications. Despite the success and obvious benefits, not all faculty have bought into the program. Interestingly, the faculty who oppose the program are not senior faculty, but a small vocal group of junior faculty. Their argument is that the training in career planning is wasting time that the students could spend at the bench getting data for grants and papers so that these junior faculty can get tenure. While I empathize with the Sisyphean struggle for funding and publishing, I feel that this eat our young attitude only perpetuates the problems plaguing the biomedical research enterprise. I can only hope that my note helps TWIV listeners value career diversification of PhD scientists so that we can start the process of saving biomedical research. Thanks again for the wonderful shows. My commute is not complete without a Twix episode. And Brian, as he said, is an assistant professor at UMass Med School. Uh, Nice letter. Yeah, excellent letter. These are great ideas. Well thought out. These are very good ideas. It's not easy to implement them, though. No. Because every place, you know, has their own ideas. And and not everyone's going to do the same thing. But I was thinking as I was listening to this, I'd like to see some sort of, you know, chart or spreadsheet or some sort of data gathering that's that shows where the other 90 percent of PhDs end up. Oh, yeah, I've got that as a as a slide in the careers talk that I give, or at least I've Uh sometimes included it as a slide. There's a. Um, survey of earned doctorates that's been conducted by the National Academy of Sciences. 
Um, I'm one of the random folks who got picked for it. So every several years I get this survey in my email or, well, used to be in my mail. Um, so you, do, you, do you still have food on the table? Yeah, basically it asks, it asks a series of questions um, and they've got the information on how long you've, you know, since you finished your PhD, what are you doing? Are you employed full time in which of these sectors or other, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so these, these data have been tracked since hmm. the, I think since about the 1970s. Hmm. Um, and that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. A, a lot of these statistics come from how, how we know that less than 10% will end up uh, in tenure track faculty positions uh, within a reasonable time frame after finishing a PhD, for example. Um, so yeah, that, that has been tracked. Unfortunately, it's not extremely high resolution. So they track people. Are, are you working in industry as a scientist? Are you working in um, the private sector, not in a, in a primarily research oriented role? Um, and then there's, I think it goes down to the level of what industry sector you're in. Um, so they would track me as being in publishing, but that's about as far as it goes. Hmm. <clears throat> it would be okay, cool if you, could, if you can find the link to that at yeah. some point. Yeah. Yeah. We I'd, can stick it in the show notes. I'll yeah. Check for that. Show notes. You know how to get to show notes, Dixon? Micro. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Kathy, you there? She's muted. Yes, yes. Oh, I was typing, you. so I muted myself. I just don't want you to be gone the rest of the episode, or at least. <laughs> no, 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 because I'm I'm entering some additional stuff that we'll talk about when we get to picks of the week. So okay, and I've got the survey of earned doctorates. The National Science Foundation um, does this, so okay. I will put it in. Uh, Rich, <laughs> can you take the next one, please? Uh, the, uh, the this letter from Mark looks mostly like a listener pick letter. He's got like. Three listener picks here. Dear Dr. Cav, that's D-R space K-A-V, and in parentheses he says, Dixon, Richard, Kathy, Allen, Vincent. I thought you might bring your attention to this website, maybe for a listener pick, and the website is sciencemomsdoc.com. Uh, and it, among other things, uh, well, I had a look at this website, and it looks awesome. This is um, several women who are moms, and who are also scientists uh, who are basically uh, promoting science and in particular uh, are on a crusade against uh, anti-science and pseudoscience. And the, among other things, they've made a film. He says, I haven't watched the film yet. It's not free. But the website speaks to what comes up in your discussions on anti-science and pseudoscience topics. Mostly, it's in defense of GMO foods. What's your stance on that? Maybe you have discussed it in other podcasts. I'm sorry, but I only listen to TWIV at the moment. Thanks <laughs> for all you do, Mark. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're, uh, we love eating genetically modified foods and all of the <laughs> DNA therein. We're just crazy about it, right? Well, we've talked about it on Twitter, yep. actually, multiple yeah. mm -hmm. times. And uh, yes, we, we have no problem. But, you know, I recognize that some people do not want to eat them, and that's fine. You can do that. But I eat them all the time. My son argues with me vehemently about this. He says people, Is that should, right? have, people should have a choice about what they huh. put in their bodies. They do. <laughs> They do have a and if people if people want to spend ridiculous amounts of money buying organic food, and part of the organic movement is that they're all anti GMO, you know, eat your Ben and Jerry's ice cream and and i I do too because it's good ice cream. but um, you know, eat whatever you want that's labeled as being non GMO and that's all fine. Um, i I do object to this movement by the multi-billion dollar organic industry to try to stigmatize <laughs> GMO foods mm. by forcing them to be labeled as GMO foods. Um, that's, I think that's totally inappropriate because there are already labels that say when things are not GMO. So that's fine. You want to, you want to pay extra for all of your food to, to avoid foods that have been determined by rigorous scientific tests to be completely safe. Fine. That's not my problem. <laughs> So you see, we uh, have talked about it on Twitter. So yeah, we have talked about it on Twitter. <laughs> a little bit. I will. Little bit. I will eat DNA regardless of sequence. I really don't yeah. care. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I will eat DNA regardless of sequence. I That's like right. that. That's right. I agree. Uh, so he goes go on. P.S. I, I have a listener pick. That was a listener pick, but he's got another one. I recommend the Science HIV website. 
scienceofhiv.org, hosted by the University of Utah's Janet Iwasa. Janet obtained her PhD in cell biology at UCSF and is now working as a molecular animator and artist. There's a career for you. Mm. She takes complex biological phenomena and renders them in 3D using similar techniques as Hollywood animation studios such as Pixar and DreamWorks. Her Science of HIV website illustrates the very complex life cycle of HIV as a teaching tool for educators as well as a hypothesis generator for researchers. Very nice. I looked at that. It is nice. PPS Janet would be a fantastic guest on TWIV as well. Her story is awesome. Tuivo's Nels Elde is a colleague of Janet's, and I'm sure she could. Uh, he, I'm sure, could vouch for her awesomeness. I have talked. I know Janet's work very well, and I've talked with Nels about getting her on one of the shows. So we will have her. She does really cool stuff, and she tries to get other people to do things with their area as well to tell you how you can do this when you're not, you know, even if you're not a great artist. So that's pretty cool. Dixon. Hannah writes, Hello, TWIV team. I've been listening to the ongoing discussion about work-life balance in academic research. As someone who left academia, I thought I'd share my perspective, if only to counter the survivorship bias. I've loved learning about science ever since I was a little girl. I finally remember being five years old, asking my mom to read me from the big book of Tell Me Why, or waking up at six in the morning to watch Mr. Wizard's World. As I grew up, I got a lot into computer programming. I studied computer science in college with plenty of biology courses on the side. As much as I enjoyed learning, my focus on academics at the expense of everything else took its toll. I was exhausted. However, as I was also young and naive with no experience with failure, don't laugh, but I somehow convinced myself that I could pursue a PhD in computational biology and arrange my schedule to have more free time. Grad school would be a a fresh start. I would focus only on my best subjects. Nobody said I couldn't keep my studies to a 40-hour week. As you can imagine, that didn't work out too well. It became impossible to balance teaching, coursework, and research with the free time I needed to maintain my mental health. It was a painful realization. In the end, it all worked out for me. I now have a great job working on software for the healthcare industry. Still, I can't help but feel a little sad and bitter over the high-pressure publisher parish culture in academia. I think it would be better if there was a non-PI job track for people who want science to be their career, but not necessarily the central focus of their lives. I hope you'll forgive some negativity from this disgruntled former PhD student. In any case, I'm grateful to have the Tui series podcasts to teach me about so many fascinating biological topics. It's inspirational how all of you maintain such passion for your work and still have energy left over to educate others with these great podcasts. Well, by the way, two of us retired. Thank you for all your work. Hannah, P.S. The weather north of Boston is a cool three degrees Fahrenheit, minus 16 degrees C, with clear skies and a wind chill advisory. Well, that's fine with me as long as I don't have to go out and shovel snow. Yeah, the idea of a non-PI track we've talked about yep. several times in the past year. John Udell has talked about that. You know, that you can do that at NIH. Staff scientist positions are exactly that. It's not as common England too. elsewhere. England has it a should, similar. It should be. That's right. Yeah, it yep. should be more common. Chief technologist. Chief technologist. Yep. Yeah, I've seen that in Australia also. Then When I was in Walter and Eliza Hall, they had a laboratory that was the solutions-making lab. They made all the SSCs. They made all the hybridization solutions. They made all the the gel mixtures, so that nobody could claim that the reason why their work didn't uh, actually uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> go forward is because they screwed up on making the stuff, you know, like pouring the gel or something. You couldn't miss on that one because they they did all the work for you. Yeah. All right. Let's do a couple more. We have two about publication. One from Abraham, who sends a link to an article by Sir Timothy Gowers. It's called Peer Review, The End of an Error. (laughs) (laughs) It's an article about, it's in uh, the Times Literary Supplement, about peer review. And uh, whether we should keep doing it in light of all the mistakes that have been made, like Andrew Wakefield's wrong paper and, and others that he cites, I think three different. Articles. Do we need formal peer review in order to help us discover what is worth reading? And so it's worth reading his article. Yeah, it was a good, art- uh, yes. good article. Mm-hmm. It's good for that. 
And he is an assistant professor in mathematics, statistics, and computer science, which is very interesting that he's listening to TWIV. Mm -hmm. Now, I like R.C.'s thought experiment here. Right. What if Wakefield's paper had been posted on a preprint server? Because one of the one of the points that uh, this article makes is that uh, on preprint servers, an article does get peer reviewed, uh, and in fact, pretty rigorously. Uh, and that made me wonder. You know, would Wakefield's paper have even survived yeah. if it had yeah. gone on, a, on up as a preprint? And I'm guessing no. You know, the other thing that people uh, often overlook in this Wakefield story that we talked about a long time ago is that in the very – people people didn't like that paper from the beginning. And in the very same issue of Lancet, there was a column, uh, a, uh, an editorial uh, or a comment by uh, Bob Chen, and I forget who the other uh, uh, author was, taking that paper apart piece by piece mm -hmm. uh, that was absolutely – 100% accurate, showed all of the flaws and predicted all of the negative uh, fallout. And everybody talks about Wakefield's paper. Uh, hardly anybody knows that that other paper's even there. Hmm. It's amazing. It's true. Until very recently, that other paper was behind a paywall, but Wakefield's yeah. paper, which had been, which with the, with the bright red um, um, retracted stamp uh, emblazoned across it, was freely accessible. Yeah. Hmm. Great. Yep. I pointed out the discrepancy to the Lancet, and after some some additional back and forth, they eventually corrected that so that both are now freely accessible. Good. Um, Good. Not that Pretty that true. not that that helped a whole lot, but <laughs> just saying, one of the reasons that the evisceration of Wakefield's paper did not get as much publicity was because it was it was hard for a lot of people to get right. to. I'll bet you. I'll bet you never would have made it on a preprint server. I don't know because one of the issues here. Um, is I mean this article starts off with very dramatically with the, the bit about Wakefield and then gives a couple of examples from mathematics about posting to preprint servers. And the thing is there's not there's not a whole lot of um, uh, money to be made and shysterism surrounding uh, abstract mathematical proofs. There right. just isn't. Whereas Wakefield was paid, millions of dollars by um, uh, plaintiff's attorneys to try to drum up a case against vaccine manufacturers. And that's actually where his paper came from. The funding for that was done for that purpose, mm -hmm. which is something that was not publicly known until Brian Deere, an investigative journalist, came along um, considerably later and uncovered that interesting fact. Uh, so there's, there's a huge industry built around the kinds of shysterism that Wakefield was was promoting. And my concern is that if you put that on a preprint server, it may not matter that the comments from the scientific community are overwhelmingly negative. Hmm. I'm, I don't know, because yeah. we haven't mm -hmm. tried yeah. this experiment. I do think that preprint servers are probably a good way to go, even in biomedical research. Um, I think they probably can't be much worse than peer review. So it is worth a shot, but I'm not sure that that would have prevented what transpired there. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know. As Kathy points out, also the PACE trial papers would have been interesting right. to see those mm -hmm. on a PACE trial for chronic fatigue, which Dave, Dave Tuller has written about extensively over on Virology Blog. Turns out to be, it was published in Lancet, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Strike two has re has the data were yeah. were released last year and show that the conclusions were wrong that there was no improvement from having people undergo uh, cognitive therapy and behave and uh, exercise and so forth for this uh, affliction. So yeah, I mean, putting papers on a preprint server lets everyone see them and people comment obviously, and it can I think it could make a difference, but who knows what would have happened? Hard to say. Yeah. Uh, Chaim sent a letter, uh, a link to a New York Times article entitled, Many Academics Are Eager to Publish in Worthless Journals. <laughs> this is something we talked about last year, also all these uh, predatory journals that will charge you a lot of money to publish your paper. I'm surprised because 
doesn't do you very much good to publish in one of these work, worthless journals. But uh, Gina Collada, who's the the uh, author, has looked into this and says, especially in places we have to do a lot of teaching, you don't have a lot of time to do research, uh, this may be something that's useful for them. So that's a Times article. Check that out. And let's do a couple of more. Um, we are at, Kathy, can you take Greg's, please? Sure. Greg writes, Dear Twiv, as a lawyer working in tech with a background in microbiology, I would like to respond to Sam, Twiv468. Because policy is made at all levels of government, understanding science and the scientific process <laughs> is important to government workers. We often speak of the 50 states as laboratories of law and policy, but government rarely acts in ways reflecting the scientific process. If you are interested in helping officials make better policy, please offer your assistance to local government and provide science-based guidance. Perhaps more of our governmental laboratories will draft regulation that evaluates results based on a stated intent and makes recommendations for further changes. Thank you, Twiv, for the great work. Greg in rainy Seattle. <laughs> and I went back because I couldn't quite remember uh, what Sam wrote about uh, in that TWIB 468. Uh, basically, it started out uh, in a PhD program, um, but then he revised his graduate education plans and decided to go to law school instead and uh, was pointing out that there's a need for science-trained lawyers and judges. And then uh, Greg is elaborating and saying you don't necessarily have to be a a trained lawyer, you can also just uh, participate in your local level of government and provide science-based guidance. Although having both backgrounds would probably be helpful. Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. All right, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Anthony um, sends a story, uh, United, United States bans most government scientists from travel to Cuba, and this was reported in Science by Richard Stone, who's um, kind of their go-to international correspondent. He goes everywhere. Um, so this is uh, quoting from the article. He talks about the, the United States' new hostile policy toward Cuba undermines confidence in joint research, says Luis Montero Cabrera, a chemist at the University of Havana. Um, the Trump administration, as John Van Horn, a neuroscientist at the University of, Cali of Southern California in Los Angeles, has likely, quote, has likely shut the door to many U.S.-Cuban interactions. Mm. Um, and, um, yeah, go, the article goes on. It's, a, it's typically a, a, of, of um, Richard Stone, a well-researched, well-written article, um, and talks about the impact of this because there are ongoing initiatives and things, collaborations that were being put together um, including things about arboviruses. Um, obviously, Cuba and the U.S. are very interested in this, both, and uh, could do a lot by collaborating, but um, that apparently is not going to work. So we had tried to normalize relations with Cuba, right? Yes. And now Trump is rolling that back, is that right? Yes, that's basically what's happening. And Mainly because it was something that was done under the Obama administration, yes, so he correct. wants to reverse it. I think that's the only, the, the only, only motivation for logic. Yeah, there's no reason to do this. There's no reason to do this. All. There's no reason why we should be bitter enemies with Cuba. The Cold War is over. They're, they are an important nation in the Caribbean that we really should be working with. We have a lot of their former citizens living in our country. There are all kinds of reasons why we should normalize relations with Cuba and this is just stupid. Mm -hmm. And part of it is science, scientists not being able to visit, which is what this yes. article is about. Okay. Yes. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one? Josh writes, Vincent and Company. This was just released on PubMed today. See below. This seems to be speculation at best. The sample size is too low. I can't believe a reputable journal such as Vaccine would publish this. There's no prior evidence of this at all. Not every uh, now every anti-vaxer is going to quote this paper. Um, compelling earth-shattering claims require compelling earth-shattering data. I just don't see that here. And the uh, paper that he uh, quotes is uh, from Vaccine, published in September of 2017, entitled "Association of Spontaneous Abortion with Receipt of Inactivated Influenza Vaccine Containing H1N1 uh, PDM09 in 2010-11 and 2011-12," and he gives the 
you know, some of the summary of the uh, paper. And I guess the implication, I have not looked at this paper, but the implication is that the vaccine is causing spontaneous abortion. Um, and, well, uh, it's, associated, yeah, it's, associated. it's associated. Associated with. And they're right. very careful to state, um, well, I haven't read the whole article, but because um, it's paywalled at Elsevier. And uh, <laughs> uh, even, but even in the abstract, um, they're careful to state that this is not causal, um, does not and cannot establish a causal relationship, uh, but further research is warranted. I would also note that one of the authors is at the CDC. Um, the other authors are at the Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin and Kaiser Permanente. Um, so these are not uh, some wackos in some obscure location. This is this is a serious epidemiological analysis um, looking at the data and saying, Hey, you know, it, when you look at these data, you can you can see this statistical effect. We don't know what it means, but here it is. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and and I don't think this was irresponsible to publish. I do agree that the anti-vaccine folks are going to be all over it and making claims about what it says, which it doesn't. Um, but I I think this is straight up the job of public health people who look at the data and and look for correlations like this, which may very well mean nothing or may be worth looking into. It could very well be that there was something else that was associ- associated Entirely. with the abortion and it wasn't picked up in this study because they didn't stratify the data properly. And that, that's why we need to look more because yes. obviously it's important. This is an inactivated vaccine as far as I know. And right. uh, it's important to know what, what's going on here. But you may remember that we talked about a paper a few years ago where it was an association of flu vaccine with narcolepsy, right? <laughs> right. There was even a paper saying this is the mechanism, and it turned out right. to be all wrong. So that's the way science works. You f- you follow it up and see what's going on. And I agree that this isn't a, this isn't the final answer, but it should be followed up for sure. And and it's unfortunate that we live in an environment where there are people who will pounce on this and of try course. to try to use it to yeah. hype whatever kind of snake oil they're selling. Um, but I don't think we should self censor based on that because then they win. It's the same kind of thing. It's not limited to vaccines, you know. Now everyone says Apple is slowing down your iPhone, so you'll buy <laughs> a new one, right. right? Right. And no matter how much Apple explains. You, you can't change their minds. I mean, I was right. at a faculty meeting the other day, and I heard someone say, "Hey, you hear Apple is slowing down your phone?" <laughs> I mean, come on, <laughs> that's not why. <laughs> People do not see beyond the initial facade. It's really well, too bad. It's not just vaccines; I, I it's think, everything. I think part of the problem is people are now primed to see. Um, conspiracy in all kinds of places because in fact there are people who are trying to screw you over um and and that's part of the problem but that's true absolutely uh, there are no doubt about it but there are some good people out there yeah and, and i think i think this was appropriate to publish and i think I, I agree that it's unfortunate how it's going to be cited but yeah um it does have to this type of work does have to be done and when you find results you have to report them we do not hide we do right. not Dixon, can you take the last one? It's very long. Can you handle it? I'll do my best. Okay. Oh, wow. This is long. Twivea Cree. So this is from Steve. It's from back in October, I must say. That's about all I heard on this week's Twiv, between the bit about the need to be clear and avoid jargon and the letters and the weekly tips. That aside from your pick, I didn't know it was actually legal to make one's own gunpowder and fireworks, even in the UK. I could understand such a nonchalant attitude to dangerous materials in the weapons-obsessed USA, (laughs) but was surprised to find it here, too. It's quite bad enough that I hear fireworks almost every night now, when they only used to be allowed on or around Guy Fawkes night. (laughs) I've often wondered how this came to be allowed. As an ex-chemist, I don't think you're ever an ex-chemist, but you're not practicing anymore, I guess. Uh, I'd, I'd like to keep a basic selection of chemicals for various cleaning and other aerosol chores and DIY purposes. And I had noticed independently when buying these materials, I was often offered the opportunity to buy additional chemicals and solvents that could be mixed with them to make something pretty ob- obviously explosive. 
I have kept quiet about it through not wishing to draw attention and less altruistically through not wanting to shut down sources of decent quantities of plain basic ingredients that would have been hard to get in ordinary shops at reasonable prices. It comes at some, at some, it comes as some surprise that it is being taken so lightly even in the UK. I was already concerned enough by the ease with which people seem to be able to obtain fireworks all year round. You'd think that at least the fire brigades and insurance companies would be complaining, while it's the sensational sensationalization that apparently took place in the media over black powder, I did not see this, is to be regretted. I think that people are being much too casual about allowing the home production of incendiary devices. They may not have to be big to be used as effective weapons, and if all one's ball mill were to catch fire, it would be very difficult to put out. Incidentally, I used to work in a place that machined magnesium alloy parts, and the local fire brigade once came and asked some swarf so that they could have so that they could learn how to handle a fire of it they set light to someone in a bucket and could not put it out so should people children be buying magnesium ribbons and making their own thermite at home and one only has to look at what what has been achieved so far in the ukraine this year with the use of small drones and incendiary devices three ammunition dumps taken out so far didn't know that by the way, um, Swarf, I, I <laughs> just had to tra- I had to translate uh, <laughs> that. I, I Googled it. Um, that's uh, fine metal shavings. So if you're making oh, magnesium okay. alloy parts, mm-hmm. you yeah, have a yeah, bucket yeah. of uh, right. of fine metal magnesium shavings, which, of course, once you ignited them, you wouldn't be able to extinguish. You got it right. Hmm. Uh, as I'm housebound, I would not want to lose the ability to buy useful chemical compounds and solvents from Amazon, but one also needs to allow for the destructive mentality. Disrupt. Yeah, destructive mentality of most of the postal services that deliver them. It is the norm that anything that can be damaged will be deliberately kicked and thrown about until it has been achieved. Most of the time, the packages they are throwing about and piling up all together and then holding in their arms are not labeled as to what's inside. Now I try to make sure not to order incompatible things at the same time as you simply can never know how they're going to be packed, combined, and handled. I have been handled... I have been handed battered boxes that had a bottle of concentrated sulfuric acid drain cleaner inside, along with other items that could be set on fire if the cowboys had managed to (laughs) burst it. (laughs) When I had to carry this in the past, it has been in a special carrying frame and was held well away from my body as I still got holes in my clothes. I also uh, once had both the liquid ingredients of a popular explosive before I knew about that explosive delivered in the same cardboard box. Can you skip the next paragraph? I will. More stories, but fine. <clears throat> maybe. Maybe I'll regret writing this, but anyway, Amazon and its affiliates, and to be fair, all the other email order supplies as well, allow things to be packaged and delivered by <laughs> reckless cowboys who treat every package as a harmless football. Regularly has me both angry at the point of destruct- destruction. I once received a strip light that had been broken in half to get it into the box <laughs> and fearful for the harm that must surely come to at least some of the hapless post people. The blog is right to decry the way news is routinely re- sensationalized and that ridiculous stories are taking over due to the need to chase clicks in order to attract infernal advertisers. But the writer appears not to have much experience of buying things mail order, or he would not invite people to take things so lightly. I have quite a collection of pictures of routinely bashed up particle parcels I have received, but can only get at the ones with the laundry power, so this device attached. On one, one other thing, read those ads that take up whole screens so you can't get around them. There are various reader apps and add-ons that you can get just that just show you the text and the thumbnails of the articles and pictures. I've used readability for years, but it is not being maintained anymore, though I think it still works. On my BlackBerry, I could not seriously use the web without the readability app that was built in. Whenever pages take time to load, or one of those infernal log sc- login screens, cookie requests, or other ads take up the whole screen, I just press R to get the article that I'm trying to read, neatly reformatted to minimize screening down. It's totally brilliant. There are similar ones built into PC versions for Firefox. I expect there must be Apple versions as well. Another way to get around the page blocking ads or nags is to turn off JavaScript while you're on the offending page. This often gets around logins too, but don't tell anybody. All the best, Steve, in Lutton, England, where it is warm, wet, and windy, but this is much appreciated compared to what the elements have been throwing throwing the U.S.'s way lately. 
Thank you, Dixon. <sighs> You're welcome. So, this I think we must have talked about something where someone made a bomb a <laughs> long time ago from homemade materials. I, I think right? this might have been, there was a little news dust up a little while ago about how Amazon's algorithms, if you ordered certain items, <laughs> they would automatically suggest yeah, uh, yeah, people yeah. often buy these other items that for making explosive. <laughs> exactly, yeah, right. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Yes. Okay, let's uh, do some picks. Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, a this is this is a project that I gather is going to continue for all of uh, 2018, and it's influenza one day at a time. So currently they're up to January 5th, and every day they're going to update. If you, it's got a little description at the top describing what they're doing. Um, and you can you can click on these individual dates and get the update. Uh, so let's see, January fifth, nineteen eighteen. Uh, the top news was the uh, coal famine, um, <laughs> and a uh, coal miner was hospitalized with influenza in a, rem- a remote town in Nevada. Um, and uh, goes on about the the news of the day. Now this is going oh, to get a lot. It, what was it's- that? It's cool because it mentions Jeanette Rankin. Um, yes. And uh, I, there's, she has a foundation that provides scholarships for women. Uh, right. There is a, scho- a foundation named after her now. And so um, it's just cool that she made it into this news blurb. Yes. <laughs> um, is this yeah, because the, it's the 100th anniversary? 100th anniversary of the 1918 flu. Mm. And so they're going to they're gonna give you news from 1918 through this. And it is going to... Um, it is going to become dominated by U.S. entry into World War One mm-hmm. and the Great Influenza. Wow! Yeah, if you cool. go back and you mouse over uh, January first at the end of it, it says the outbreak would be reported one day at a time. In these mm-hmm. next three hundred sixty-four days, we'll provide this report. I like this, this is really cool, Alan. I like this yeah. headline here. <laughs> Uh, so, um, Je- well, Jessica Taff on Twitter <laughs> forwarded this to me. She's an epidemiologist and. Uh, She's, milder, uh, milder weather promised on January first, nineteen eighteen. And who would promise such weather? <laughs> <laughs> really, and would they come through? Cool, Rich Conde. What do you have? Uh, let's see. What do I have? Oh yeah, you have something good. I looked at. Yeah, I got an uh, elephant elephants. for Christmas. You, you got an elephant for Christmas. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. My daughter in Boston and her family gave me an elephant. Oh, I see. Um, yes, of course. So uh, this is the. My pick is the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust, uh, which is uh, operates out of a, a park in Kenya, um, and uh, their specialty is uh, uh, rehabilitating orphaned uh, animals, in particular uh, elephants and oh, rhinoceri. Right. And to support their efforts, you can make a contribution to be a foster parent of an elephant or a rhinoceros and uh for some contribution i don't know what it was i uh, uh am now the foster parent of a young elephant named mock and i've given his link there too so that you can mm-hmm. uh, see what's what's happening he's a cute little guy yeah. they're all they're all um, cute at that age <laughs> he was uh found, he was found uh, orphaned apparently yeah yeah Poachers. found orphaned in a Poachers. place that's um uh, not uh, really a uh, is an a uh, hostile environment relative to humans uh, in conflict with humans, uh, and so he was uh, choppered out of there and uh, moved to uh, Savavo West National Park, where this uh, foundation is, and they're taking care of him and rehabilitating him with a bunch of other uh, orphaned animals. And you can read all about it. Yep. And if uh, I'd like to visit this place. Go, yeah, you would. Go for it. it. looks cool. I've seen a documentary on it, and it's quite wonderful. Elephants. So there you go. Elephants and whales what? are so cool. They are. Yeah, a little twib bump for those guys. Nice. Yep. Dixon. Buy yourself an elephant. Dixon, what do you got? <laughs> well, I have something which... <laughs> I, I can give you – I will just give you a brief history. I, I always say that if you add up all the land in, an, in, the, in the world that's being farmed, it would equal the size of South America. That's just as a rough estimate as to what's going on. But, you know, I, I got that information by piecemealing from FAO and, uh, and NASA and all kinds of other websites. And, uh, you know, it was I, I thought it was accurate, but I had no real numbers to go with it. So, so day before yesterday – I'm reading my uh, issue of American Scientist, and there 
in one of the pages is a um, a mosaic of Landsat eight photographs all stitched together to equal the world's um, map for where we farm. Okay, this is croplands. Now these are not uh, grazing lands. These are just croplands, uh, the plants that you put into the ground and allow to grow back up, and then cut down and then sell for produce, that sort of thing. And the green in this map shows you where those are. And if you look at this map, you'll get astounded by the fact that all of India is green, the entire country. And it's surrounded by brown. And it's surrounded by brown. <laughs> and if you look, wherever you look, this map is good to three uh, square um, mil uh, meters, so that the res resolution of the Landsat 8 is, is incredible. You can almost read a newspaper using this thing. So they, they gave a number. They, they could actually add up how much land now is actually being farmed. And at the moment this picture was put together, it was 1.87 billion hectares of land. Now, you go to the CIA website and you look up how many square kilometers South America equals, and then you convert that to hectares. <laughs> <laughs> and I came up with 1.74 billion. Uh, you're right. Hectares. I would know. Right. I was wrong. I was. I underestimated it. <laughs> yeah, close enough. Yeah. Well, or, it's depressingly close. What I came out of is that <laughs> Greenland is screwed. <laughs> Does anybody live there? Yes. People How many do. people live in Greenland? About forty thousand. Uh, they must import everything, right? Yeah, first peoples, yeah. they're called first peoples. Even Iceland doesn't have a lot of green. They don't import a lot of things there. No, they do not import a lot of things. They eat a lot of meat. They they raise meat there. Yeah, yeah. well, they, they they hunt and they fish. That's right. And and Denmark. So I see I see light green and dark green. On you do. This. It's the light do. green that's the that's the cropland. Right? You have to but, actually yeah. read the article to get the difference between those things. But uh, it depends on the crop, and it depends on how many times a year the crop is produced. So what's the, uh, what's the story with India? Are they just good at 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 growing stuff? Because why is there a sharp border between them and? Everybody else. <laughs> well, you'd have to ask India that, wouldn't you? But okay. Pakistan is thrown in there also. Yeah, it's Pakistan. Yeah. So that's not, and so is Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is over there as well. So that what it really means is that from, mm. for the ma majority of the time that India has been a country, it's been a rural country. There have been cities, of course, but most of the fruit is produced in the countryside. All of it is, in fact. I, I think this I, is also geological because the border, yeah. it's not an exact yeah, right. border of India. It's, There's a it's desert India, there. Pakistan, Bangladesh, and then you've got the Himalayas. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And there's and obviously Tibet. there's nothing growing there, nope. and then you've got high desert um, into the interior portion of China. That's right. So I think that's the problem. And to the west, you've got the uh, the deserts. You're getting into the deserts of the, the Middle Gobi, East. That's right. That's right. Um, in so, fact, the, the deserts might equal the larger size in South America if you had that. Right. Up. Mm -hmm. But it's it's quite telling that that wherever you, you can look now, and there's no way to hide. That's the point. You can't hide anymore. And one of Trump's initiatives, of course, is to decommission the uh, Earth satellites. Why? What do you think? So you can see what's going on. Don't want to know the truth. That's right. right. That's exactly why. Horrible. Yeah. It is. I want to go back to on a tangent. The mm -hmm. Most of the food in Iceland is imported. So yes, it it's is. really expensive. This is true. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. very true. Iceland. Except for the fish. <laughs> yes. You're right. So these places are ripe for places for the, for the vertical farm initiatives. I would say, but I, I didn't want to say that. I just wanted to say that for years I was saying, you know, you just fact checked the, yourself. Now. The yeah. I just fact checked Very myself. Good. I'm uh, I'm surprised at how apparently sparsely uh, f uh, farmed the U.S. is. Correct. Yeah. This is well. That doesn't include grazing land. Remember, this does not include yeah, grazing yeah, land. Yeah, fine. So no. if you added that together, Rich, you'd have probably three quarters of the United States. Well, but a lot of our a lot of our arable land that used to be farmland has also been abandoned. And that's true as well. So I, I live in Western Massachusetts. It yeah, used no, to be you're right. All, it used to be all farms, and now it's all third growth hardwood that's right. forest. That's right. You know, the part of California is that's farmed is not huge compared to the no. rest of the state. But look it's at right. where it is, and, right and down the center. They had a six-year right. drought, and that's all irrigated, drought. right? Well, yeah. yes and no. If you have the water, well, don't they steal it from Colorado? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Colorado. They they had a rough time with that area. Let's just put it that way. By the way, that's the. One of the hot spots for the outbreak of West Nile virus every year also. Mm -hmm. Kathy, what do you have? Well, first of all, I want to go back to the beginning when we were talking about it being freezing in all 50 states. It <laughs> took me a long time because you can't really 
put in Mauna Kea into weather.com and get anything meaningful. But eventually I got to the site that has the Mauna Kea Observatory's forecast. So I happened to go there about six years ago, this time of year. Oh. And you can go up to the visitor center at 9,200 feet. Basically, you can go there from sea level. So you might get sick if you go too fast. <laughs> and then uh, there's a visitor center there and it's cold. And we happened to be there when it was uh, pretty close to a full moon. So we couldn't have seen as much as perhaps we might have. But then you can, uh, in some way, make arrangements to go up to 14,000 feet where the observatories themselves are. But I found this link that has uh, showing the temperature for January 4th. Uh, so let, wait, let's go to, well, January 4th, it was minus 5, <laughs> minus 0. 0.5 okay. Celsius. Mm -hmm. So there's our data about it being cold enough in Hawaii. It's freezing in Hawaii, of course. So I, right. found, I found a Scientific American article on Tuesday. Temperatures in all 50 states dipped freezing or below. And, mm -hmm. and Mauna Kea was uh, 30 Fahrenheit at the time. Right. Low temperature, yeah. Right. So, so that explains that. Correct. Okay. So my pick of the week. Pedant. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this, this, this really falls squarely in the pedantic thing. Good for you, Kathy. That was brilliant. We, we talk about the weather and we fact check the weather. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, my pick is because I was given a pendant for Christmas that is the disc of the image that uh, is on the Voyager uh, spacecraft. Right. And so in looking up stuff about that, I found that uh, as of – uh, November, you can buy the NASA audio record that we sent out mm. uh, to aliens. It's a two CD set and they give the list of all the things that are on it. <laughs> and it also comes with a 96 page hardcover book containing the backstory of the record and the Voyager mission. And it's a reason pretty reasonable sum of $50, they say, with shipping in time for Christmas. But maybe now you need to get it in time for Valentine's Day or something like that. But it does not come you know. stamped on a solid gold disc, though, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it comes as two CDs and then this hardcover book. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Very but it's cool. Not, I, I had never or really appreciated this list of things. It's quite yeah. diverse from things all around the world. Very interesting. Somebody setup. once summarized this, uh, this disc of information as basically expressing, we live here, we're made of meat. <laughs> exactly wonderful exactly. cool so if you were to send that today what what difference would you make in the disc oh, i don't you, think you, we should have sent this out in the first place <laughs> <laughs> you don't think we Why should not? send what, our what, human what are you worried I, about I, if if there's <laughs> life out there i'd rather be us finding it than it finding us yeah true and they'll show up on our doorstep. I mean, look bombs, at you know? look at human history. The people who get found do not do well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, I, I think no one's going to find this. Probably I'm not. I'm not worried. Do you that. remember a Twilight Zone episode <laughs> a long time ago? Uh, I think it was a Twilight episode. Uh, episode where uh, aliens came and uh, gave everything to, to people. Serve man. And gave, to yeah. serve man. To serve man. That's it. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. and they had this Bible with them. Sure, yes. somebody figured out it was a cookbook. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's they right. were there to serve men. Ah, uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Cook them up. Okay, my pick is a book by Daniel Ellsberg. Anybody remember that name? Oh yeah, the Pentagon Papers. It's playing in your local theater now. What yeah, is I'm going to go post. See that. It's called the Post. The post. The post. Yeah, I'd like to see that. It looks yeah, by great. a second-rate actress, Meryl Streep. Oh, of course. And Tom Hanks. Of course. Uh, this is the Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. <clears throat> and this is just amazing. So as you know, Daniel Ellsberg went and copied papers that revealed what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam, and everyone got all up in arms about that. No pun intended. Uh, but apparently he also faxed a lot of other papers about our nuclear capabilities, and he's lost, apparently lost them, but now he remembers enough to write a book lost about them. it. <laughs> and this is all about our nuclear program over the years. And it's, you know, it's got a lot of science in it, the science of nuclear war. And here's the thing, you know, we think everything is in 
good control. You know, we've got a huge nuclear arsenal. Even now, after we've destroyed many, we still have a large arsenal. We used to have B-52s flying you around. Mean our button is bigger than his? And, and basically, <laughs> you know, he says, if you think Trump is the only one to threaten people with nuclear war, it's not true. Many other people have. But also to realize that what the U.S. has done with our nuclear capability is to have plans to wipe out entire countries in case of uh, of, of war or, or missiles coming at us. So all this is here. It's quite interesting. You know, he talks about the extent of damage that would be done uh, if things got out of hand. And you end up coming away with the, you're very, it's very scary to know that uh, we have this capability and that other people have as well. And the, and as we know that our government is increasingly fallible and uh, you should not feel safe that uh, these things couldn't go off, you know? Um, so he, you know, he said we should definitely not have, uh, any first nuclear use, but, uh, I, I highly recommend it. If you don't know much about the nuclear program, go back and see Dr. Strange love. Dr. Well, Strange love. I was just going to, well, say. you know what? Basically there was a review of this book in the times book review a couple of weeks ago. And they say at the end, what we realize is that Dr. Strange love was actually not fiction. It was true. <laughs> And that's the way it is. So uh, that's that's the uh, the real Doctor Strange love. Pretty scary though. And it, wow. it's uh, shortlisted for the 2018 Andrew Carnegie Medal really? for excellence in nonfiction, according cool. to the Amazon site. Yeah. All right, we had a, a pick from Mark before, and uh, two picks from Mark, and we have one from Steve who writes. He gives a link to a. Paper, a brilliant and highly important and relevant paper from Karl Popper in 1983 in the British Medical Journal that shows why the pace and smile researchers won't admit they are wrong. It's because they are medical doctors. So the pace and smile trials for cr- treating chronic fatigue, myalgic encephalomyelitis. Mm. This is an important point for those considering work produced by the new trend towards MD PhDs. A pure scientist can afford to be wrong and may welcome a negative finding as much as a positive, but a medical doctor is expected to be right and can get into serious trouble if he's wrong. This explains everything. I would suggest that the paper be required reading for research scientists generally, but compulsory for any doctors thinking of going into medical research and scientists going into medical practice. Scientists can be wrong. Medical professionals are not allowed to be. This has serious implications for the body of research generated by medical professionals and explains why they won't give up on ideas which, in Popperian terms, they cannot prove right, but they may have proved false many times and refuse to see it or even covered it up as an artifact or statistical anomaly. Um, and then he says, he asked me to put this as a pick of the week on Twitter. It's really brilliantly pre- presented just as right now as it was in 1983. And indeed, as Popper points out, it was at, as the turn of the 19th century when Florence Nightingale brought up the same shortcomings of the profession derived from its origin as a licensed guild, as I have argued myself. So he, he sent the, this email to Twiv and he also copied it to uh, Dave Toller and Julie Remeyer. Julie is a uh, writer who's, who's written a book on chronic fatigue syndrome and her experience with it. And she replied, I think that's an excellent point, although I also think the Popperian view of the scientific process doesn't align so well with the actual practice of science. Scientists get pretty attached to their own theories too. <laughs> it's good. So check that out. It's, I, I do believe it's uh, open access. This 1983, the critical attitude in medicine, the need for a new ethics. All right. That is TWIV 475 for 2018 microbe.tv slash twiv apple podcasts if each of you sent us a dollar a month we would be eternally grateful but do what you can microbe.tv slash contribute and you can send questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv kathy spindler is at the university of michigan in ann arbor michigan thank you kathy thanks i forgot to say that the elevations of those two centers on mauna kea are at 2,800 meters and 4,200 meters. I'd done the conversion and <laughs> just forgot to say it, so I wanted to add that. Anyway, thanks, Vincent, for putting together TWIV for us, getting us papers to read, doing all the uploading of the shows and creating the website and everything. We couldn't do it without you, and it's really much appreciated. Oh, my pleasure. It's a labor of love. Dixon de Pommier. 
can be found at parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you, Vincent, for your uh, continued vigilance in the virological, <laughs> microbiological, parasitological, and evolutionary and immunological fields. I mean, you've, oh, you've covered the waterfront. I love it. I know you do. I'm having a good time. I see you every day, and I can see it on your face. When you time. walk in with this big smile on your face, <laughs> it's, it's, sometimes. <laughs> because it's not my job, I guess. <laughs> right. Uh, Rich no. Condit is an emeritus. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time, and my thanks as well. Uh, and happy birthday. Thank you. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can find him on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. And thank you. And I'll reiterate the thanks from the other folks. And what Kathy said is absolutely true. We could not do this without you. So uh, stick around for another 65 years. Uh, it's always a pleasure. We'll try. We'll try. Well, I'll go away for a year and see what happens. Ah. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music at the start, ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>